Uh, Bill did ask me to come and preach in particular around a particular theme around the Reformation. It's 500 years since that moment when a remarkable, courageous uh, Christian leader called Martin Luther, he was a, uh, a trained to be a monk, um, had previously trained to be a lawyer, but then he got called by God and uh, became a monk. And uh, God revealed some wonderful truths to him that not only did he uh, transform his life, but has transformed um, the life of the church, in fact, the life of the Western world profoundly. So there's a lot of um, thankfulness to God for what he uh, revealed to us and continues to do so through this per person called Martin Luther. It's a great theme. It gets to the heart. The, uh, I describe it as the taproot, the root that grounds the Christian faith in these themes. So let's pray that God would speak to us afresh and uh, help us to know how to, to listen, understand and to respond. Loving God, we do thank you that you are a God of all truth, a God who guides us, doesn't leave us in the dark and gives us foundations for life. We thank you for your word that we can have confidence, we can have direction and such a sense of purpose and life itself into, into eternity. We pray as we listen to your word, listen to your spirit speak to us, that you'd help us to understand and to work through how to respond in ways which honour you, which is faithful, obedient. We know it only happens through your spirit, so we pray that your spirit will be going deep into our hearts and our minds to reveal the richness of that truth and the way in which it uh, transforms us as your children. Amen. You know, there's occasions when you just want to be able to switch off and not to do anything particularly uh, taxing or otherwise, and sometimes watch a little bit of TV or something like that. My wife, Fiona, and I particularly enjoy a uh, show called Antiques Roadshow. Anyone seen Antiques Roadshow? It's, a, uh, it's not going to change the world. It <laughs> might change a few individuals occasionally, but it's just a, it's a show where it happens around uh, the UK, and uh, it's advertised that these experts, a whole range of experts, are going to visit a town and be at a location, and people can line up and bring all their trash and treasure before them and hope to discover some particular really uh, precious treasure that they had tucked away and didn't know about. And uh, you see the long lines of people queuing up to have their time before the experts as they work through. And you sort of know by the length of the lines that the vast majority of stuff that's brought is probably trash. It's actually not that <laughs> all that valuable. But every so often, someone comes across something that is an absolute treasure. You know, it's been tucked away and... Uh, I uh, didn't know much about it, but my grandmother passed it on to me, and it's been a box, and I brought it out, and whatever it is, and they go through, you ought to know it, but it's actually a masterpiece. It's something that's incredibly precious, and the dramatic moment at the end of the segment is always, how much might this be worth if you're going to sell it on the market today? And people's eyes and saying, you know, a certain amount of money, and it goes higher and higher. They're not all like that, of course. That's only the exception, but often we hope for that sort of treasure. Well, I want to share with you today a treasure that is beyond value. A treasure that is so profound, so rich, so priceless, that even if we gathered together all the wealth of Adelaide, if we managed to bring all that wealth and say to God, could we have it? So that's not enough. Even if we got all the wealth of Australia together and brought it before God... And God would just shake his head. In fact, even if we had all the wealth of the world gather together, God would look at us and say, but you can't buy it. It's priceless. It's a treasure of that nature. One of the things that uh, can be really rich around uh, families is how one generation may pass on something of great value from previous generations. Sometimes the... Uh, the uh, antique roadshow would come for some things that are passed through the family through generations. 
in uh, in my family and also my wife Fiona's family. One of the great treasures that's been passed on is a family Bible. Fiona has one from her great, great grandmother, I think that's right. Um, And all her handwritten notes inside it, pressed flowers. She obviously read the Bible regularly and prayed, written all these notes on the margins and so on. And to realize that for some of us, God has been working through the prayers of previous generations. And I encourage you, if in your family life, whether as, as a brother or sister, or as a child, as a um, parent or grandparent, godparent, step parent, parent in the, in the faith, pray for the next generations because they make an enormous difference. The treasure that we receive is available to everyone. When I said before, you can't gather the whole wealth of the world is not enough to buy it, but it is available to every person, every living person, everyone in this room, everyone in our neighbourhood, everyone in this world. It is available. And it comes free of charge. Doesn't matter how impressive you are before God. Actually, it doesn't matter whether you've messed your life up or how good you are or how um, many achievements you have. It's certainly not divided into the winners and losers. I hate that language, dismissing people as losers and others. It's not according to a value system that our world might have of more worthy people. We'll come back to that a little bit later. It is available to every single person. To give an example of it, the focus of it, it is right here in front of us. Often when we're looking for those treasures and we go deep into the boxes of our history or things that are tucked away or maybe even buried, I don't know what it is, this treasure is right here in front of us. And Jesus uses a a great example of how to recognize what this treasure actually is. I'll get to that in a moment, but I'm going to start by just painting the little scene of how Jesus expresses it over against the world of his day. You see, the treasure is the phrase we've talked about it, we've sung about it, we've prayed about it already this morning. It's the kingdom of God, the world in its fullness, life that is flourishing and it is good and it is harmonious and it is full of vitality. The question is, how can we enter that kingdom? It's a bit like uh, when we travel um, some occasions and if you do some international travel, you'll get off a plane and go through a, a lounge and you'll come to a point in which it'll be the, the border of some description. And you need to work through how can you pass from one side of the counter through the border into the other side of the counter. You're working through what sort of entry could I get? Well, we want to know what the answer is. How can we get into the, the border of the kingdom of heaven? What passport can we bring? What can we offer? What can we need to do that we can get beyond the border control, the border security, if you like, to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because we can't just stroll in there. In that context, in Jesus' day, they were full of debates. So they had lots of uh, scholars, lots of people expert in the law, um, working through, well, what does God ask of us? to ensure that we enter the kingdom that's been promised. And they say, well, there's the, uh, the commandments. So, well, how many commandments? There were 613 commandments in the, the scriptures of their day, is what we call the Old Testament. That's all they had at that time. They counted them, put them into different categories. There's the really, really important ones, and there's ones that are sort of important, but you know, there's a little bit of grace around those ones, and there's others that um, are just have good advice, good direction for life. And around those, the big ones, they were so anxious that they get, get it right because if entry into this kingdom of God, getting beyond the border security for the kingdom of God requires a, uh, to be able to say, look, I've achieved it all, I've ticked them all off. They need to make sure they're not breaching the law, a bit like when we have a tick the customs cards when we come in. 
So of the 613, they had some definitions of the big ones, and one of the ones, that, as an example, would be the, uh, not to work on the Sabbath day, the one day a week that is the Sabbath day. The commandment is clear, day of rest. Well, but how do I know what is work and what is rest? So the, uh, the lawyers of the day, the theologians, had an answer, saying, well, we've actually got a, a rule book, it tells you. Turn it up here and it tells you there's 39 definitions of what you can and can't do on a Sabbath day. You can't take something from one side of a table across the room and put it down somewhere else. That's work. So you better make sure before Sabbath starts you've got everything where you want it to be. You can't cook a meal. So you have to make sure you've done the cooking before the day. <laughs> so it's catching on. This is a good one. Yeah. Um, you can't sew more than two stitches because that's work. You can't go through a field and just pick off the heads of the wheat because that will be like harvesting. And all these definitions. And people were so anxious of I'm making sure I'm keeping all these laws and everything else. How can I get it right before it? So when Jesus was around, they're asking him the same question. What do, what do we have to do? What does God expect of us? And Jesus said, well, you're not going to find the answer in all your definitions and rule books and everything else. He said, it's actually not rocket science. What does God expect of you? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And if you love God, then you will love your neighbour because it's just like it. Love your neighbour as you'd love yourself. You heard that before? <laughs> Incredibly profound. Jesus said, that's, that's the commandment, that's what God expects. But, well, that is fine, but what if we're not doing that well enough? So, in amongst all the different debates that Jesus was involved in as a teacher, there was an occasion, there's a number of ones in which I could use, I'm just going to choose one in particular that I think illustrates it really well. Jesus was in full teaching mode and crowds were coming to him. Because he was teaching, he was healing people, he was praying with people, he was doing wonderful things. And uh, the disciples had it sort of organised and where were we going to be and uh, they had a bit of crowd control as people were coming to see Jesus. And some families were coming to see Jesus and they wanted their children to be blessed by Jesus. He's a, obviously a remarkable person. He's obviously a prophet, he's obviously in touch with God. If only he could bless their children. And the disciples, when they saw what's happening, said, oh, no, 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 no. He's too busy. He's teaching. He's got a program. You know, he's uh, busy doing what he, what he does. And Jesus got to hear about it. and said, no, oh, what are you doing? Don't stop the children. Don't hold them at a distance. Let them come to me. So he sat down and had them on his lap and he had them in his arms and he did bless them. But this is the point. Jesus actually said at that point, you know what? You adults out there need to learn from these kids. There's something about these kids, these children, where they know how to receive the kingdom of heaven that you adults really need to learn from because most of you have got it wrong. That got their attention. Jesus often pointed to very unlikely people to say you can learn from these unlikely people in our wider community, great truths of the kingdom. Sometimes some of the examples Jesus gave stunned people, saying, how can we learn from this widow who's obviously had a difficulty in life and all these things? Jesus says, you can learn from the children. Now, I have to say that my wife, Fiona, and John, for that matter, are really into this children business at the moment because 10 days ago, not that we're counting, but 10 days ago, um, we had our fourth grandchild. Gideon, lovely name, lovely face, and uh, fourth grandchild, the first for our daughter, um, so it's a whole new thing for her, and uh, it's just so engrossing. So throughout the, uh, the week from time to time, our daughter Jess shows, sends us little 10 second clips of Gideon, um, you know, Gideon hiccuping. Gideon yawning, Gideon opening his eyes. He just has to be Gideon and he's actually already such a, a rich, wonderful thing. And it's a bit tempting for Fiona and I and I'm in a meeting there and I could see another little videos coming in at this meeting and I'm just sort of bringing my phone out and thinking, oh, look, it's lovely. 
So is Jesus saying that we need to become as innocent as a baby? Gideon is still pretty innocent. You know, even though he does wake occasionally and other stuff, can't really hold him morally accountable just yet for, you know, that sort of stage. And as I looked at Gideon and reflected on how wonderful children are and babies, I thought, actually, I'm pretty confident that every person in this room was a baby at some stage. Yeah? We didn't just sort of arrive out of nowhere. We were the centre of our mothers and fathers and grandparents' eyes. We were doing all that stuff that Gideon does, yawning and burping and hiccups and the whole bit. So we have to sort of revisit something of that. What happened? We grew up. Children actually do grow up. It's a pretty good and healthy thing to do. We take delight and we pray for it. But as we grow up, we discover that Sometimes we want to do things our way, not necessarily what our parents have asked us to do. And uh, to put it bluntly, fairly candidly, not only do children discover how to sin, some children can discover highly original ways to sin. Things that we never even thought of. And actually, when you think about it, that is true of all of us. That actually marks our lives through and through. Now, Jesus is not being unrealistic. He's not saying you've got to rediscover that innocence of a baby, of a child, and then you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a misunderstanding. What Jesus is saying is captured in one word he uses. That's the, the clue to what he meant. Unless you learn to receive the kingdom of God like these children. That's the clue. What does it mean? Well, there's one thing in particular that children do so naturally and so honestly that the more, as we get older, we lose almost invariably. One thing we can learn that is a spiritual truth reflected on what children do so well, and it is to receive a gift. When a child receives a gift, it might be a Christmas or a birthday gift all wrapped up, you don't see many, if any, children receiving a gift and saying, oh, that's lovely all wrapped there. Let me put the wrapped gift up on the shelf and I'll open it later on. Do you see children doing that much? <laughs> there, you know, rip it open. And say, hey, it's mine, it's wonderful. Look at this, look at this, and go around and show everyone else what they've got. Children love to receive a gift. And if a child receives an incredibly valuable gift in some way, do you see a child opening up this amazing super duper Lego set or whatever it may be? Would a child then say to their parents, oh, I don't deserve it. I'm sorry. I'm not good enough. Take it back. No, a child do something. Wow, this is amazing. Open it up. Make use of it. It's mine. Take delight in it. Jesus says, you know what? As adults, we lose that ability to receive gifts. Bit of confession time. Who finds it easier to give rather than to receive a gift? I love giving gifts. But as adults, we tend to think if we receive a really extravagant gift, a really generous gift... We don't know how to receive it. And we do find ourselves like, I'm not good, no, I don't deserve it. All those sort of reasons. Not to take it and own it and receive it. Jesus says, that is grace. It is learning to receive a gift free of charge, out of the generosity and the love and the extravagance of God, of the kingdom of God. And saying, just receive it. The verse that's used, there's a number of verses we could use. In fact, you could pretty start anywhere in the Bible, because from the first verse of the Bible right to the final verse of the Bible, it's all about the grace of God. But one in particular, I think, really summarizes it really uh, helpfully for us. Paul writes his letter to the Ephesians. And uh, in this letter, he has this little 
phrase, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. These are the only verses I want to focus on because we could just spend uh, the rest of the day and much more unpacking these verses. This is the way Paul puts it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you have been offered this free gift. Gra faith is receiving it. Reaching out and receiving it and unwrapping it and owning it. That's what faith is about. By faith you have been, sorry, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not the result of works so that no one can boast. No one can say, well, God, actually, I've done a fair bit. You know, I've worked hard, I've made some sacrifices, you owe me. You can't do that. We'll come back and finish on that note a little bit because it's so easy to slip back into that space. And you know what? There's another temptation at this stage. Is that the accuser, the evil one, the word Satan actually means accuser. And that's that little voice that goes in our head and says, what are you doing receiving that grace? You don't deserve it. I know that actually you're a hypocrite. People think you're great. I know the truth about you. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be standing in that space. Yeah? That's precisely where the accuser tries to get into our head. You don't deserve the grace of God. And the answer is, of course we don't deserve it. None of us does. It's a free gift. What God expects of me is to take it and receive it and own it. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So that can be summarized. We are saved by grace, the free gift of God, through faith, our receiving that gift of God. Why? So that being freed of that, we can now devote ourselves to doing the good works that God expects of us. You cannot reverse the order of that verse. You cannot say, well, if I do enough good works, I will then receive the grace of God and receive it by faith. You cannot do that and you must not do that. Because both it will be crippling, but it's also the totally wrong relationship with God. People have a pervading sense that there is a greater being out there. We name it as God. That's the more generic term that might be used. But what people picture by way of God is many and varied. So part of our conversations when we have people when they talk about our relationship with God is, well, what sort of God do you believe in or maybe what sort of God don't you believe in tell me about the God you don't believe in one of the deeply uh, embedded perceptions of God is that God is uh, like a Father Christmas like Santa, a heavenly Santa Claus God is expected to give us always good things so we may have a perception of God that God owes it to us to ask to give whatever we ask for. I mean, sometimes we selectively take a few verses out of the Bible and view God in that way. I'm claiming it, I'm naming it. Well, only the ones in which God has talked about for the purposes of God's mission. God isn't there as someone who is indebted to us in anything. God owes us nothing in that way. Another false view of God that we need to strip away is the belief that God is a negotiator. That we can do a deal with God. God, if I do this, and if I give up that, or if I'd whatever else, then we'll have a deal. And you'll favor me, you'll bless me in some way. God doesn't do deals. There's nothing that we can actually bring to the table. Imagine if God said, okay, what are you going to offer me? Maybe it's my house. I actually gave you it in the first place. Oh, maybe it's your, my abilities. I've got gifts in different ways. I gave you that in the first place. Uh, maybe it's some wealth. I've got some resources. It's mine. But actually, there's nothing we can bring to the table of what we can give to God. And God isn't to do, into doing deals. So we set that aside. 
But the thing is, it frees us. God says, rather than being preoccupied, how can you gain my favor? How can you try and be good enough or have enough achievements or all that stuff? God says, I'm actually not, not into that because I can see right through it. How about you just don't worry about committing your whole life to trying to g gain God's favor? Just receive it as a gift. Because that frees you up to say, I don't have to stress about that. I don't have to live each day thinking, am I good enough for God? God says, I'm here. <laughs> You're my child. That's all that counts. What I want you to do now that I've, you have received that grace is to focus on the things that do matter. And that is that we become vessels of grace. And I'm going to finish off with that in a short time. So let's bring it back to Martin Luther, because Martin Luther came at a time where the church had lost its way in that. The commandments that had been given, the teachings of Christ that were so clear, had been mired in a whole range of agendas and conventions and corruption. You've got to imagine yourself in a world in which you don't have access to a Bible. You don't have your own copies of the Bible. And when you hear it, it'll be read in a language that you don't understand, in Latin. If you had a question about how can you avoid the horrors of life, and you'll see them graphically displayed in some great paintings and uh, portraits and murals, and you'd see these gargoyles and others looking on, and the fear was that if you don't get, do the right thing by God, that will be your future, you'll go to hell. So if you want to ask the question, well, how can I try to avoid that? It looks dreadful. I don't want to go there. How can I gain God's favor? You would only have one option, which is go to the priest. And the priest will tell you, give you the answer that they were told to give. Someone comes and asks you, how can you be sure and confident that you avoid hell and that you can enter into the kingdom of God? Answer, give to the church. So that became people's obsession. Am I giving enough to the church? It has to be the best. And even better to have works over and above that giving. Try and give in abundance and more. And at the time when Luther was discovering us himself, because as he was trained for the priesthood, he began to read the Bible, being a fine scholar, he could actually read it in the Latin and understand it. And he said, Actually, I don't see anything in the New Testament saying that to gain God's favour, I have to give to God and give to the church. That comes after. He discovered grace and said, it comes as a free gift for everyone. It transformed his life and he was crippled before then, um, almost physically, but certainly psychologically with, with guilt with doubt and saying, I'm not good enough, I can't do enough good works, I fall down so much, I'm aware of all the sin that I do. It was so crippling him, and suddenly he discovered that was all released. There's a beautiful phrase, and probably my most uh, favourite hymn, which is one by Charles Wesley called, And Can It Be? I love the phrase, was picked up in one of the songs, And Can It Be? And I was thinking, I think that the all-time favorite phrase I have is that lovely phrase where it says, my chains fell off, my heart set free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. That was Luther's experience, spiritually. Freed from the guilt, the chackle, the, the weight of it, to rise and set forth. This is the, the, the experience of Luther. And when he began to observe it, he was in a marketplace and there was one episode he observed that really got under his skin, got him riled up for good reason. It was about a, a man called uh, Johann Tetzel who was uh, sent by the church from Rome and uh, he was offering indulgences. An indulgence was something offered by the Pope at that time in the medieval church. It's not the same now, so it's the medieval church is not the same as the modern Roman Catholic church. That's a different culture and entity. The Roman church has also discovered grace, by the way. It's wonderful. Um, Tetzel was saying, there's a place called purgatory, which is where you would go if you are not actually in hell yet, but it's in the balance. 
And if you do the right things in purgatory, or if your family on earth do the right thing in purgatory, or some people act on your behalf, you might be freed from purgatory, so you're not going to go down to hell and go into heaven. And guess what? You could actually buy it. Buying indulgences. And it was so popular, people would queue up in the marketplace and come to Tetzel and uh, give the, uh, their money. And it was so superstitious, they said, even the sound of a coin dropping into my basket of collection, into my money bank, will release one more soul from, from uh, purgatory. So people were pretty keen to drop coins in the name of their family and friends and others as well. Luther observed that and said, what? That is so, so wrong. And it took him a lot of courage to do so because the Pope at the time actually had a pretty big building program for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And that was his main income stream. And uh, Luther, who was pretty candid, actually said, <coughs> um, actually, Pope, you are the most wealthy person in all the world. Why couldn't you build that basilica yourself? <laughs> rather than going around and asking everyone to try and provide through these indulgences and stuff. So Luther said no. And he went up to the, uh, the university chapel door, um, Castle Church in Wittenberg. He was a professor there and says, I will debate these 95 statements, known as the 95 Theses. That happened 500 years and two weeks ago. Um, so the 31st of October was the 500th anniversary of that moment. And since then, the debate and the talks went, and the church has reformed and continues to be reformed. So we have to be thankful for Luther, but thankful especially that he pointed us in the right direction. And what was Luther's teaching? It is by the grace of God that we are saved, through faith, that we are free to do the good works that we're called to do. Well, that was certainly a powerful moment in the history of the church and a powerful moment for Martin Luther and for those who followed him. How does it continue to speak to us today? One of the titles of a book that I uh, found incredibly helpful, um, and I highly commend it, is one by a writer called um, Miroslav Wolf. Miroslav Wolf was a Croatian pastor and theologian He's now based, has been based in the, uh, the States for a number of decades. And the title of his book is called Free of Charge. It names it. Free of Charge. That's what the word grace means. Giving and forgiving in a world stripped of grace. Giving and forgiving in a world stripped of grace. It isn't just that we need to revisit and relearn that our faith and our, our identity as a child of God is not of anything that we have done or achieved or earned to gain God's favour. There is nothing we can do to present ourselves before God as though I deserve to come through that border control. The only passport we have is the passport of Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. That is what it takes for us to go in. But you know at times we get sucked into that space, personally, where we think through, I've got to present myself well. I've got to show others that I've got my life together spiritually. So we naturally tend to hide our failures and our weaknesses in others. But that leads a, a really powerful temptation. Because Satan will go in and say, you don't deserve it. You're a hypocrite. What are you doing there? It constantly chips away at us. So it might be this morning our hearing and responding to God is actually saying, I've been sucked into a bit of that. And I need to refine that solid ground, that foundation of life of God's grace and find my peace in there. But it isn't just that we receive the grace of God as a gift, like a child knows how to receive a gift. And avoid the adult response of saying, I don't deserve it, I'm not good enough, you shouldn't have done it. We also need to be givers of grace. Our calling as a church, we use a phrase called being the means of grace. It actually means we are the vessels. Our world desperately needs grace. We live in a spiritually 
uh, parched environment where there's so little giving and forgiving without strings attached, without conditions. So our calling when we go out of this church today is to be taken and to be a vessel of God's grace. And the wonderful thing about it is that the weakest amongst us, the weakest in terms of how the wider world views people by value and success people and are able and all that sort of stuff, the ones that can't keep up are the ones who actually can be the most powerful vessels of God's grace and God's love. I learned that a number of years ago, many, many years ago, when my wife Fiona and I attended a special needs school. It was the first time we went to one, one called Parameadows. I still remember the occasion. We went to the school assembly and uh, it was quite a noisy event and occasion. You know, it's like when you have a primary school assembly and each class has their act to do. They will do their act up on the stage. And what's the rest of the school doing? Mostly ignoring them until it's their turn. So, you know, that's, what, that's the way that schools tend to develop, kids tend to develop, you know. We'll get our moment in the sunlight and we're down, you know. They can do what they do, that's how it's all fine. It's all about them. When we went to the school assembly for a special needs school, and I still remember the moment because it all brings a tear to our eye. They actually had a signing language choir singing What a Wonderful World. It was one of those moments and, you know, <laughs> we're all captured as they were singing that beautiful song. But what I still remember, when they finished their signing language thing, because it was such an achievement, the whole school erupted. All their friends were falling up, clapping and praising and thumbs up and it's just wonderful. And I thought... That captures something about being the humans that we're called to be that the rest of us need to relearn. Unconditional friendship and love and time for people. God says every one of us, from the weakest to the strongest, can be the vessels of God's grace. Sometimes it can just be a hug. Sometimes it can be just a taking time to listen to someone and actually saying, actually, how are you? Are you okay? Sometimes it's just recognising that the person on the checkout has had a long day and just being patient and giving them a smile and returning their greeting. <laughs> Whatever it may be, sometimes it's looking out for our neighbours, looking out for our families, looking out for our workplaces. We as the church need to regain our calling to be vessels of grace, to be known for our graciousness and our love and our time for people and not saying, get your life together, be the winner of the success and then come and join us. But saying, no, join us as you are because actually we're all much the same. We're all works in progress and working in that space. Free of charge, giving and forgiving in a world stripped of grace. That is our calling. I'm going to slip into an Anglican mode of things to finish up. Make no apology for it. Occasionally we get some things right. In our Anglican services, um, I'm saying it tongue-in-cheek uh, very much, we actually each week use a prayer of confession. It's a bit of an Anglican thing. Rather than having people go to private times of confession in a cupboard somewhere, um, we say, like, let's have a regular pattern. Uh, when I grew up as a child, my first words in our liturgy at the time were, Scripture urges to acknowledge our many sins and not to conceal in the presence of God, our Heavenly Father. It's actually my DNA. We do it because it's actually a good habit to do. But also it actually enacts the gospel. So I'm going to finish with a prayer of confession. And uh, it's actually one of the ones that we use in the Anglican Church each week. And I suspect you won't find it hard to identify with it. And I want to encourage you just to either to sit uh, even kneel is what we do occasionally as Anglicans. Um, not always. But with your head bowed before God, have that spirit of coming before God and knowing you can't even look God in the face because you know the truth of your life. What follows that is what we call the absolution, statement of forgiveness. And at that moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. 
and to have a sense of the, the weight and the burdens of what you have being stripped off, the chains falling off. And as you stand, feel free, this is an Anglican saying it in a Pentecostal church, to raise your hands, <laughs> confident in receiving that grace of God as a child of God. Yeah? Amen. Okay, let me start with that. Uh, the prayer of conf confession, then I'll follow it with the best news you'll hear all day. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess with my whole heart my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, my wrong thinking, and my wrong speaking, the hurts that I have done to others, and the good things that I have left undone. O oh God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you. Raise me to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now would you care to stand?